You found it. Your home for the best content on your favorite team, the Fighting Tigers of LSU. Do us a favor, subscribe to the channel, leave your comments below, and be sure to smash that like button. Let's start with the two commitments, and then we'll go into the, the recruiting weekend, who is here and what it all means. Uh, C.J. Jackson, this is a former Georgia Tech commit who decommitted and now picked the Tigers. Tell us about him. Yeah, this is a guy who's from Georgia, um, so there was the Georgia Tech connection. But uh, don't think, okay, Georgia Tech commit, come on, Brian Kelly, you got to do better than that. This is a kid who we have it on three ranked. This is a top 100 player knocking on the door of top 50. Uh, and the number seven edge rusher in the country. So this is a big, big deal. And you, everyone will remember, they chased Colin Simmons heavily through the spring and the summer. He's the five-star uh, edge rusher who ended up signing with Texas, or excuse me, committing to Texas uh, over LSU, while his teammate Caden Durham, the running back, picked LSU. His other teammate, DeCorian Moore, who is a five-star uh, wide receiver for next year, picked LSU, but Simmons picked the Longhorns. And at that time, everyone said, okay, they kind of felt like they went in all in on Simmons. What happens now? Who's your backup plan? And it turns out it wasn't much of a backup plan. It was kind of someone who they had planned on all along and CJ Jackson, who had visited in the spring. He had taken an official visit in the summer. And when he committed to Georgia Tech, um, which his mom is big on academics, it kept him close to home. Uh, he said, look, LSU is one of two teams that just never quit calling me. And that showed that they knew that no matter which way it went with Colin Simmons, they wanted to see if they could stay involved with C.J. Jackson. He reopened his recruitment last week. So to get him on campus immediately and then get him committed before he left campus was a big deal. And it didn't happen on a whim. Like I said, they've been recruiting him heavily for a year now, and he's made three to four trips to campus. He's very familiar. He's already got an official visit and is Back, or, you know, in the books to LSU. So he knows the program. He knows the ins and outs. This is this is a big deal. This will be one of their highest ranked commits when everything is said and done. Right now, uh, see on three has him as uh, is this right number or is this the composite one eighty eight overall? Uh, in- That'd be the composite, right? Yeah, the, I think on three's got him in the seventies uh, or something like that, sixty seventy uh, overall. Si- yeah, like here it is. Here it is, sixty four overall, number seven uh, at his position, number ten in the state of Georgia. C.J. Jackson. What? So Edge would he be that big end, or would he be the Jack linebacker? Jack? So that's the we rank edges as Jack linebackers often, and the DNs as D linemen. And some DNs can kind of fall. Like for instance. Deshaun Womack was ranked as an edge. Well, he's big enough now to where he's playing DN for LSU. So it can be a combo. It could be someone who plays Jack linebacker or plays that Savion Jones DN position. Got it. Let's talk about the other commit, uh, Teron Francis. He's a wide receiver for 2025, and that's an, uh, an in-state kid. What, what can you tell us about him? Yeah, he's coming out of car for next year. Uh, and they, they call him at Carr and around New Orleans Manchild, and he is all of 6'1", 6'2", 200 as a junior in high school. And <laughs> you don't go running around at Carr and St. Aug and Warren Easton and pick up a name like Manchild and it not be for a reason. This is going to be one of the best uh, receivers nationally. He debuted today on on three. And again, this is a mid-season update for next year's class. He didn't have a ranking before. Automatic four-star, automatically in the top 300. So, He's highly thought of by not just LSU, but the recruiting services. And Frank Wilson and staff got him in this weekend. And gosh, they had a lot of car guys there with Bryce Brown, their head coach, and uh, get him on board. And Matt, they've got three three guys right now on the roster from Carr. They've got now a commitment for next year. And uh, you even looked in the future, 2026, guys who are sophomores, they already have two offers out, Richard Anderson and Aiden Hall, a D-lineman in the safety, who are nationally ranked. So keeping that car pipeline and those pipelines and those big New Orleans schools open uh, with guys like Frank Wilson and Cortez Hankton, who both are St. Aug grads and, and grew up in New Orleans, is massive. We know that. We've seen so many kids come out of those areas uh, over all the years, and a lot of people are high on Teron Francis. And I know some people say, hey, I can only focus on one recruiting class at once, and I can't deal with juniors. Well, I'll just give you the small tidbit that now for these juniors, LSU has two commitments in at receiver, uh, one being a five-star, the other being Teron Francis, who's the number one receiver in Louisiana for next year. So I'd say they're off to a pretty good start. Shay Dixon's with us on Twitter, at Shay Dixon. Um, 
Yeah, I want to talk about the recruiting weekend here in a second, but one more just sort of big picture. Now a little more than a year in for for Brian Kelly, I guess almost two years, a year and a half in for Brian Kelly. Have you noticed any sort of evolution of the recruiting style or approach with respect to the state? Yes, I have. I think that they see, and this is what's called in LSU's eyes, right? In the eyes of you're recruiting the heavy hitters, the top-ranked guys. This would be a down year in the state. So to give you an example, they have seven guys right right now in the on-three top 300 who are from Louisiana. We did our update today for the juniors. Um, so they have seven seniors who are top 300 nationally. The junior class already has double digits, and they're just midway through their junior season. So that number is going to grow even more. Usually they average about 12, 13, 14. So they prioritize Louisiana. I think did a really good job of evaluating guys who are high three stars, and we've seen those types develop time and again at LSU. I can't tell you how many times, um, or I guess I could. I could go through the whole list, but <laughs> who do they add at the end? Russell Gage, Foster Morrow, Duke Riley, Lloyd Cushenberry, guys who weren't highly ranked coming out, were maybe some of your final offers as seniors, and they end up multi-year starters who play in the NFL. So the, I think that, or I know from kind of how I've seen them recruit, that Brian Kelly is prioritizing Louisiana and then understanding, which I think is the correct approach, that you can go to Texas, you can go to Mississippi, you can go into Georgia, obviously. You could dip into to Bama um, and recruit or Florida and recruit these guys. You don't have to fly all over the country to address every position. Now, yes, you're going to recruit nationally. Yes, you're going to try to get a couple of guys here and there. But the base of it being Louisiana and this border states, I think that that's the approach they're going with. And I've said it time and again, not only by the numbers is that the right approach, but now that you're in the transfer portal area, getting guys who are from around here, are, they're going to be more likely to stay on roster if they're not playing right away because they're not a million miles from home. Yeah. Um, it's a great point. He's on Twitter at Shay Dixon from On3, the Bengal Tiger. All right, Shay, uh, I saw your tweet, and I was actually listening to you and Hanny on, on Eagle 9 8.1 Game Day on the pregame show, and you were running through a massively impressive list of visitors that were on campus this weekend can you first of all before we go into some details can you just give us some context on uh who was here this past weekend for the auburn game yeah they had uh, more than 15 guys who are ranked in the top 150 were on campus so that is a massive massive number but it wasn't just that it was a lot of players are the number one player at their position, and I don't think it gets any bigger than Bryce Underwood, right? The number one overall prospect in the country for next year, a quarterback coming out of Michigan who has not named any final two or anything, but most believe it to be LSU versus the in-state Wolverines. And it, I've kind of drawn it up to make people understand who aren't diehard recruiting fans, but follow LSU football, what a commitment like that would mean. It would be the highest ranked out of state guy they've gotten since a Russell Shepard or a Patrick Peterson. And he's viewed as maybe the best quarterback prospect to come out in the past five to 10 years up there, Caleb Williams, and maybe above it midway through his junior year. Absolutely phenomenal player. And you get a guy like that, and the dominoes just start falling with other guys who want to be a part of it. And I can tell you, LSU was very much in the mix of this one going into the season. Yes, Michigan's undefeated. Yes, Michigan's firmly in the playoff race and all that jazz. And yes, LSU's lost two games. But LSU's got the number one total offense in the country right now. And Jaden Daniels is arguably the best quarterback in the country right now. Um, And I think a lot of people down here would make that argument, uh, that he is indeed the best football quarterback in the country uh, at the college level right now. Those things stand out to Bryce Underwood. And he's going to make his decision here in January. So, what LSU's doing on the field this season is a very, very big deal in that recruitment. I think, I can tell you this, I don't know where he's going, but they've got Michigan, the in-state team, sweating here because four visits in six months with your whole family every time shows some very sincere interest. Shay, what about the other prospects that were, uh, that were on campus uh, this weekend of note? Yeah, well, they had three Texas A&M commitments there, which kind of grabbed the attention of a lot of people as Texas A&M uh, has some back-to-back losses, and uh, these were kids that picked A&M over LSU, and LSU was kind of the second-place team there. Uh, Gabe Relliford coming out of Evangels, one we talked a lot about as a D lineman, he made his second visit 
to a game down at Tiger Stadium this year, and they haven't had many, what, four home games. So getting him back was big. Draylon Miller, a receiver who's coming out of Texas, uh, East Texas, is uh, a guy that picked LSU or picked A&M over LSU. Uh, Cortez Hankton, the receivers coach, went to college with his father, so they've had a good relationship. They get him back to campus, and there's some growing buzz that, hey, this is, might be a chance LSU could flip him into the class. He's a top 150 prospect. And then the other one is five-star Terry Bussey, who might have been the biggest surprise because he committed to A&M like two weeks ago and suddenly was back on LSU's campus for a visit. He's the number one athlete in the country, but could play safety probably at the college levels where most teams like him at. I don't know if any of them flip. I don't know if all of them flip. I would say that I bet by signing day at least one of those guys ends mm-hmm. up in LSU's class. And a look. If a and real, and I say it on your show all the time, one loss doesn't mean anything to kids because every high school kid, most of them lose a game, lose a couple of games. They get it. Usually they just think like any athlete, we gave it away. They didn't beat us. <laughs> but when it's year over year, like it is right now at Texas A&M, that you fall short of expectations, you can have all the NIL money in the world. These kids want to win. And if you're not in that position in year six with Jimbo, it's going to affect your class at some point. And, if there comes that blood in the water moment, or if they're already there, I can promise you teams like Texas and LSU who are recruiting those same kids are all over them. So to see those three guys come in, all Texas A&M commits on a day when LSU sells out the stadium and wins by 30 and A&M loses again mm. is noteworthy. Um, all right, Shay, last thing for you. Uh, I always like to ask about the recruiting calendar and what's next. Tigers have another home game this weekend, but give us a sense, just big picture of, what what to keep an eye on that's that's coming up here? We're actually going to have some guys in for the Army game. I think it'll be another pretty nice visitor weekend, so that will be uh, something to keep an eye on. Then they'll have the bye week, which will actually give them a chance to go on the road. So uh, when teams are on bye in season, they'll go on the road and watch kids play on Thursday night, Friday, Friday night, Saturday night, whatever night your high school game is. And uh, they can do some in-person evaluations or at least show face, whatever it might be. Uh, and Brian Kelly, like last year, has kind of reserves that for the bye week, as most teams do. So those will be big. Then you go to Bama, and then it's three straight home games. That gives them an opportunity to host uh, a number of more big visit weekends before you get to the end of November and into December, and you're only a couple of weeks away from the early signing period. So this is a I like for LSU how this sets up on the back end. They've got a, the number six class in the country right now. They've got 25 commits. Those are both great numbers. And you still got guys left out on the board. So uh, with um, four home games left to go, I think that LSU sits in a pretty good spot. He is Shea Dixon on three, the Bengal Tiger. He's on Twitter at Shea Dixon. Again, on Twitter at Shea Dixon. Shea, we always appreciate it, man. Thanks for a couple of minutes. Thanks so much, Matt. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Please leave your comments. I love to interact. And be sure to hit the red subscribe button below.